Coming together at different times in different places, in different spaces. We know that we are held as one in you, our Lord and our God. As we bring our worship, receive it. And as we pray as one, we share in the words that Jesus gave us to say, saying together, Our Father in heaven, you are holy. May your will be done here on earth. May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And give us today the food we need. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Strengthen us against all temptation. And deliver us from the time of trial. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours. Now and forever. Amen. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure how great the pain of searing loss the father turned his face away as wounds which mar the joy sin upon his 
shoulders. I shame thy hear my mocking voice. Call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was a His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. The reading this morning is Luke chapter 6, verses 3 to 42. Jesus answered them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God, and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is lawful only for priests to eat, and he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching, and a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, Get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and stood there. Then Jesus said to them, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? He looked around at them all and then said to the man, stretch out your hand. He did so and his hand was completely restored. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious and began to discuss with one another what they might do to Jesus. One day, one of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called to his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Blessings and woes. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples were there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, 
and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you, and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. Love for enemies. But you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them also the other. If someone takes your coat, do not withhold your shirt from them. Give to everyone who asks you, and if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do it to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend, lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend them to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Judging others. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will measure to you. He also told them this parable. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into a pit? The student is not above the teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like their teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the blank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first to take the plank out of your eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Amen. May God add this reading from his holy word.
We bring our thinking on the topic of forgiveness to a conclusion this week. We find in the Gospel of Luke a principle of Christian living tucked into one of the blocks of teaching that he records Jesus given. It continues on from the part that we know as the Beatitudes early in Luke 6. The way we tend to do Bible reading is to reduce it down to short blocks that we read in the church or even at home. It makes it easier to comprehend. But there is a disadvantage in that it disconnects sections. We lose the flow of an idea, a principle, moving into the next one, into the next one, and so on. How they build upon one another. We lose the overarching, full, extended thinking by just picking one. Plump. I'm sure we've all read the Beatitudes, Matthew 5. That's the extended version. And often it's the one that we use in church because it's the extended version and it gives you a bigger reading and it's more comprehensive and it's easier to preach from. But Luke's version is far more compact contains many of the themes that we read in Matthew around it. If you can, get two Bibles, open them up. Matthew 5, and our reading from Luke today. And just, just look at the headings that are around the Beatitudes, and you'll see how they tie together, how they hold together. Luke's is often headed up, blessings and woes, because he, he has both separated out. Then it's, there's a bit on love of enemies and then judging others and then good and bad fruit. 
before he moves on to record more of the direct, hands-on ministry of Jesus. That was one block of teaching, not several bits. Our reading today sits as part of the conclusion of this blessings and woes section. And we can see it as a principle of life and living as a follower of Jesus. It repeats those challenging words of Jesus that reminds us that as we forgive, so we will be forgiven. And also not to judge or condemn. And to give all that we are to God. And in response, God will replenish us with his own giving. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. It's the image of a generous giving God. None of us likes short measures. None of us like to think we are paying over the odds for stuff. Marketeers are good at tapping into our psyche. Packing the greatest relax. Packing the greatest lies of modern commerce. You get this great big box. And you think, wow, this must be huge and wonderful. And I'm really looking forward to opening it. And you open it and you're covered in a cloud of polystyrene nugget things. Or perhaps it's the Easter egg. You get this nice big box. And there's a little window in the box and you see the egg. And you think, oh, lovely, looking forward to that. Easter day comes and you force the lid open. And this tiny little egg is suspended in a plastic bubble. And it's virtually only a little bigger than the window. You get this feeble little bag of sweets to go with it. And you get them and kind of, my reaction is I'm disappointed. I don't enjoy Easter eggs. I encourage my wife, my family, to buy me Cadbury's mini eggs. Chocolate all the way through. Lovely. In our house, we use storage jars for lots of stuff. And every now and again, you obviously have to fill them up. You fill them up and you find there's still some left in the packet. So what do you do? Shake the jar and it goes down tap it bang it on the worktop and it, it gets all the spaces out and you find you get more in depending on what it is I'm trying to get in the jar I've even found myself pressing down the powder, the spices, the flour or whatever it is to get more in, to pack it in <coughs> that's the image of God as the giver of good things he does the same. He counts to pack it in, shake it in, press it down, get all the air out, fill it up to its maximum, and then fill it until it overflows with more. If God treats us this way, should we not extend that same grace to others? As we think about forgiveness, we would do well to see it in this big picture activity of God. First, it is God's elected nature to forgive, as we thought about right at the start of our series. He alone has the authority to fully and completely forgive us, even of the smallest or even of the greatest of sins. Secondly, in the week that followed, we considered our need for his forgiveness. And that forgiveness to be an active part of our lives. It frees us from anger. Bitterness and cynicism. It frees us from guilt. And unforgiveness can produce so much heartache and bile and bitterness that, that you see so many ruined lives because people can't receive forgiveness. Then, thirdly, God puts his plan of forgiveness into action through Jesus. And in him we have a model of forgiveness. Then to remind ourselves of those words of Jesus, your sins are forgiven you. And to discover that new life 
that these words cause to spring up in us. Cause us to live in forgiveness. But then, as we live in forgiveness, we are to extend that to others. To forgive as we have been forgiven. To be free from judgment and condemnation. To live open lives of grace. Sixthly, that forgiveness can be hard work. We may have to persist at it. To make it active in our lives. That we may be able to forgive those who have sinned against us. No matter how small or how great. Until the cleansing of forgiveness is complete in us. And we can breathe that breath of God. That moment of liberation. That moment of true wholeness. Lastly to see that as we live open and generous lives. God will also be generous in his giving to us. Because we have made space in us for all that he wants to give us, to fill us up with. As we have freed up that space, occupied by all those negative things. The things that unforgiveness produces. We have capacity to be different. However, living this kind of open life is a a challenge. And it can bring what some may regard as risks. There is the risk that others may think that they are, or can, treat us any way that they like. And we just have to take it. We are nothing more than a doormat. I don't think we are being asked to be doormats. But there is no doubt that living an open and forgiving life costs Look at Jesus. They took him to the cross and still he sought their forgiveness. We should always know that we have an option of stepping away from the relationship if it's, if it's hurtful and damaging. We don't need to stay in it. We can, we can seek their forgiveness. We can seek their restoration as lo- and ours. But if it doesn't work, we can walk away. But in addition, we have a toolkit. We have resources that those who do not have faith in Christ do not have. We have the whole armour of God at our disposal to protect, to equip us, to live open lives. He will protect, protect us. And so at the end of our series, some homework I invite you, I encourage you to take a bit of space to reflect on your life. Perhaps be willing to ask yourself these or similar questions. Do I understand the nature of God's forgiveness of me? Is there something or someone I need to forgive from the past? And what will it mean for me to live life in forgiveness? Into that last question, God may plant a seed of hope for you. Hope for change, renewal, that will inspire you to walk the ancient path of forgiveness. And find at the end a new land, a new terrain green pasture of peace and hope for your life. May God richly bless you and hold you close to his heart with each step you take on that journey of forgiveness with him. Our Father God, we wonder at your boundless love and forgiving nature. Thank you for your loving purpose that longs for us to choose
to turn from the wrong ways we've been living and to seek and accept your forgiveness. We pray that you will help us to live in the new ways that make a difference to those people we come into contact with, whether in workplaces, at home, at school, or in our leisure time. Father, we thank you that your created world reflects so much of your love and provision. We experience the seasons changing, and with so much uncertainty around the impact of coronavirus continuing, help us to remember your steadfastness and your promise that you are with us. We think of our world and it's easy to struggle with the immense problems caused by poverty, injustice, greed and self-obsession. Father, we pray for leaders who are prepared to speak out the truth at all levels of society in countries across the world and that they will remain committed to changing what they can to bring more equality to people who are hungry, homeless, ill and frightened. We remember families in our locality who have been affected by job loss and illness and people who are grieving. In these next few moments, we bring those we are personally thinking of to you. Thank you, Father, that you receive and hear our prayers and we ask them in the name of your Son, our Saviour. Amen. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. Then my burden so found. As we continue in our daily living, Lord, may our lives reflect the quality of your forgiveness, the measure of how we have been forgiven, and how we have forgiven others. And may we reflect the glory of Christ in all that we do and with all whom we meet. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us now 
and even forevermore. Amen.